welcome to our service. If you're new here, you may be wondering who we are and what this church is all about. Well, the heart of the matter is this. We're a group of people doing our best to love God and love those around us. One of the ways we express this love is through worship, because our God is truly amazing. He created everything, great and small, and His love for us is incredible, powerful, and completely unconditional. We also spend time looking into His Word, the Bible, and receive practical teaching to guide us along His path in our everyday lives. But it doesn't end when the service is over. Throughout the week, we gather in groups to serve, <coughs> pray, reach out to our community, and sometimes just to hang out and have fun. Life is full of challenges, and none of us are perfect. But we believe that's one of the reasons God has brought us together. We're all here to help and support each other through each step of life's journey, because nobody should have to travel alone. So thanks for joining us today. No matter who you are, we want you to know you are welcome. Good morning, West Shore family. Good morning. And I, I don't know about you, but I am ready for a worship trifecta. I want to sing to the Lord with all my heart. When we pray, I want to pray with all of my heart. And when he uses Corey to speak to us, I want to hear him with all of my heart. We're going to do all three today. We're going to pray. We're going to sing. And we're going to hear God preach through Corey. So will you stand with me and let's start the first thing and come to the Lord in some song of Light in the darkness, my God, 
that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. You are God as we go into you in prayer, Lord. You are the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, Lord, the light in the darkness. Fill this place with your spirit. Fill us with your knowledge today, Lord. Let us connect with you and each other in the Holy Spirit, Lord. We come here not to serve ourselves, but to serve you, Lord. Not to be seen and not to be idolized, but to worship you and you alone, Lord. We are here as your servants. Humbly, we come to you, Lord. Fill our hearts in this place with your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today, we begin with goodbye. Goodbye to shame. Goodbye to the way things used to be. Goodbye to regret and bitterness. Goodbye to apathy. Goodbye to business as usual. Goodbye to the lies that deceived us. Goodbye to whatever is holding us back. And hello to freedom in Jesus. Say hello to a second chance. Hello to a firm foundation. Say hello to mercy and new possibility. Hello to the gift of salvation. Say hello to a father who adores you. Hello to the Son who redeemed us. Say hello to the Holy Spirit, our comforter, and the resurrection power within us. This is not hype or wishful thinking. This is not clever branding. This is where we find true, full forgiveness and peace beyond understanding. Welcome to a promise that never fails. Welcome to an everlasting hope. The creator of the universe is speaking. You belong here. Welcome home. Welcome to the life abundant. Welcome to your true worth. Welcome to the family of God. Welcome to church. Welcome, welcome. Appreciate everybody being here this week. Obviously, Pastor Tim and his family are on vacation, or were on vacation last week for spring break. Um, don't know if they've got any crazy stories to tell us when they come back, but I do know that they are back and uh, sounds like safe and sound. No, nothing too major happened. Um, as we move into March, there's a couple of announcements. Uh, first and foremost, as you can see here, our March mission project is for one more child and it's our diaper drive. So if you guys are at the store or anywhere and you see diapers or anything like that that they could use, wipes, diapers, all that stuff, bring it in. They will use it. Um, it's a big need there. So appreciate everyone's efforts on that. Um, and then, you know, kind of the highlight of March for us is obviously Easter weekend, really. Um, it's not just Easter Sunday. Um, we're only about two weeks away. The first thing is that you'll see inserts in your worship guide that on Good Friday, it's not here. It's at Harvest Baptist Church which the address and everything is in there. It's at seven o'clock. It's our church and a few of our other sister churches all coming together, collaborating and presenting the Easter, um, or excuse me, Good Friday service. So keep that in mind. Um, and then two days later, the 31st, Easter Sunday, that is here. Um, and it's a little bit of a change in the schedule. So just wanna make sure everybody that's on there, but make sure that you hear it too, because some of us are like me and are auditory learners and not visual learners. So uh, 8.30 service. Then after the 8.30 service, there's breakfast at 9.30. And then you can either pick or choose the 8.30 or the 10.30, but it's not 11, it's at 10.30, but they're the same service. So um, if you wanna to come to all of that, hey, I'll be here. So, you know, come hang out. But uh, they're the same service. So 
Uh, we'll be here. Yeah, yeah, we'll all be here. You know, just uh, come hang out. It's, it's a good time. Uh, um, but uh, that's pretty much what we got going on this week. And I'll kick it back over to Joe. It's, uh, this thought just tickled me. I was like, it seems unfair to say, let's stand and worship with me when I'm sitting down. But that's how we do things here. So will you stand and worship while I sit down? <laughs> I prefer to stand for the record. <laughs> to our focused prayer time. Um, the theme of today's message is about suffering. Um, so as John comes up, the verses that I that I came to mind for what I wanted him to focus prayer on was 2 Corinthians 4, verses 8 through 9, which says, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. And the focus I wanted him to have on this prayer was that, and kind of the message today is we're all going to go through trials and tribulations. We're all going to go through 
struggles. We're all going to go through our own form of suffering. And, but even through those ups and downs, we still have Jesus. We still have eternal hope. We still have eternal salvation. And that is what we need to be focused on. And that is what's going to get us through those tough times when we think we don't have enough. Because there might be times where you don't have enough, but Jesus always has enough for you. John. our heads. Heavenly Father, we live in a difficult time, in a time where things don't always seem as they should be, in a time where even though we give our best effort, we don't get the outcome that we think that we should get. Um, but we know there's something far greater at the end of this story. The story is, you have given us a story that's complete, the story that's true, the story that's obvious for those that open their heart. We are your earthen vessels. And in that vessel becomes a chance to become holy. So when we're pressed on every side and we decipher pain or we see pain and, and troubles and things in our life that don't seem to be working out the way we want to, know that this is the process that you're taking through us to develop holiness, to develop a, a obedience, to develop a yielding to you. And it's only in that yielding that we accomplish your objective on this earth, this temporal objective, temporal objective to ascend to eternity with you. When we keep that in mind, we live with you, we live with glory, and we live with joy. And those are all of our aspirations. Um, so let us not become despondent, let us not become sad, and let us not become so dismayed that we can't roll through life when things bad happen. Let us look up to you, let us not look down, let us not look across, let us look up to you and become that vehicle, or that vessel through which you can expound your glory to the world and ultimately to reuniting with you in heaven. Amen. Amen. So today, the title of the message is Divine Suffering, with a theme verse of Isaiah 53, 5, which says, But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And I'll be honest with y'all, this week, it's, it's a tough one. It's a deep one. You know, like, suffering is is tough. It's it's hard. It's 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 not something. Am I off? Am I good? Go. Ah, there we go. Hey, there he is. Rookie mistakes. Um, thank you, Steve. Uh, but this is not for the faint of heart um, when we talk about suffering. But as you'll see, not only am I going to talk about the, the typical things you would expect with this message about suffering and it being Easter time. Um, we'll take a little bit of a different spin, so bear with me, and we'll, uh, we'll land this plane. Uh, but as I was thinking about suffering uh, this week, I was thinking about the ways in 2024, some of us might call it suffering, with an emphasis on air quotes. The first one, when you place your Amazon order, and it's either not prime, or it's not just next day or overnight. Like, it's just like, ah, this, the waiting, the suffering, that, you know, being patient, like, it's suffering. Um, the second one, if you're a picky eater like myself, um, who may or may not have even went so far as to use their pickiness and mistakenly tell a restaurant that they were allergic to an ingredient, which opened a whole big giant ball of worms and was just awful, but a messed up food order. Ah, suffering. The third one, as I think anyone that lives in Tampa and has been here for any amount of time longer than the last few years, all I got to say is traffic. <laughs> all of us suffer in traffic. And then the last one that I thought of was, and this, you know, this one I don't know, might be not relatable to everybody, but you go to the ice maker in your refrigerator and there's no ice in it because... Yeah. Your wife may have just filled it up with her 10-gallon Stanley cup. There's no ice. I'm suffering. I need a cold drink. It's hot. It's Florida, man. But anyways, all, all joking aside, though, suffering is real. Suffering is something that a lot of us go through. It's not something to, to take light of. It's not something to... I feel like we live in a time right now where there's this weird... I, I would call it really weird and kind of insulting thing where there's like almost like it's a bragging right to say that you're suffering. Like there's like a hierarchy and a tier system to the more you suffer, the more prestigious you are and the more of a martyr you are. And I just don't think that's it, man. I mean, because listen, none of us have suffered like Christ has suffered. 
we're all suffering in individual ways at different times, but he is the one that suffered the most. So if we're going to get in a comparing matchup, you're going to lose every time. Um, and Jesus suffered in multiple ways. The first way Jesus suffered was Jesus suffered as a man. As the Bible tells us, he was fully man and fully God. So that's where we're going to start right now. And this time of year, it's, and that's where you probably thought I was going to really lean hard on in this message, was the physical pain that he suffered through on the cross. And that absolutely was a massive deal. Like, I mean, it's, it's something that you got to mention because it is incredible, it is insignificant, and it is impactful. Um, and some things that I started looking at when I was going through, you know, studying on the crucifixion and just how, like, how honestly brutal it was, and inhumane it was. Um, so for one, crucifixion has been described as many as the most painful death ever invented. Like, you think that you see painful deaths in, like, horror movies or, like, you know, all that kind of stuff? No, no, no. This, this was it. And not only was it the most painful death, it's crazy that Christ is the one who was crucified when it was reserved for the most vicious, awful, terrible, terrible criminals. Like, worse than people, like, worse than anyone could ever imagine. Like, that's who it was saved for. Like, the 1% of the 1% of violent offenders. But yet, Christ went through that. Um, also, some things that stuck out to me was, during the crucifixion, every single major joint system in his body was dislocated throughout it. His wrists, his shoulders, his legs, like, every, everything was through major dislocation, which made the next point even crazier that so part of the thing that makes crucifixion so terrible is that while you're standing there, it puts this, your chest and lungs and everything in this weird, awkward position to where it's literally like impossible to breathe because you're hanging there and you're, you're essentially kind of suffocating. Um, so in order to breathe, you're having to push up on the nails driven through his ankles in order to just breathe and a normal bodily function that we take for granted. And thinking about that he had to push up with dislocated joints. He had to push up, and he remember, he's on a wooden cross that isn't like, you know, even, you know, there, there may or may not be some bad pieces of lumber you get at, like, Home Depot or whatever. You know, me and my friend recently were uh, doing that, and, you know, some of them are twisted and bent a little bit, but for the most part, they're smooth. Think about this. Like, not only was his joints dislocated, but he's pushing up on a rough, nasty wooden cross with a back that has already been torn to shreds. Like he's already gone through the scourging process and how awful that was. So he's grinding his back that's like hamburger meat, basically up and down this rough wooden cross. Um, and then there's two kind of schools of thought on what was like the final thing that actually like killed him on the cross. Obviously the crucifixion process is what was his final death. But the one is suffocation because literally, you know, after hours and hours, being dehydrated, loss of blood, all that. He just basically was so exhausted he couldn't push up anymore, and so he suffocated to death. And then the other one that is just even crazier to me, when you think about, like, God and love, and you think about, when you think about love, you think about, like, the heart, you know? We, at Valentine's Day, everything's a heart. That the second theory on cause of death is cardiac rupture, was that his heart literally burst because of all of the strain on it, the excessive beats that it was going through, and all of the fluid buildup around it. So the, the person that is the literal personification of love and of the heart symbol, it burst for us while he was on the cross. Like, it's just, I don't know, mind-blowing stuff to think about. But I think this is where we're going to kind of take a little turn, is that as important as that is, as significant as that is, as much as we need to recognize and acknowledge that a lot none of us here are going to go through a crucifixion you know we, we have laws literally preventing criminals from being executed in those kind of brutal inhumane ways so what i think is more even more relatable to us as people right now especially in our culture today where stuff is becoming more and more brought to the light and more and more mainstreamly talked about is that he went through a lot of mental suffering he went through a lot of mental anguish and pain and things like that during the crucifixion process and that's kind of what i really want to hone in on when we talk about jesus suffering as a man so in matthew 27 verses 28 through 29 it says 
They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head. They placed a reed stick in his hand as a scepter. <laughs> this stuff's real, y'all. Then they knelt before him in mockery and taunted, Hail, King of the Jews. I mean, he's hurt by their words, their actions. Like, he's literally being mocked. And as someone who, you know, sometimes maybe, as you can tell, maybe a little bit more on the emotional side and maybe a little, you know, into their feelings, a little more introspective, maybe, you know, all of that. Like, this really, it hits home for me. And I'm sure it does with a lot of y'all, too. Um, and I thought about it this week. And, you know, we always, as little kids, you hear the rhyme, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I don't know, man. I kind of would bucket that because I would argue that the pain and suffering that we go through from somebody's words last a lot longer than a broken ankle or a pulled muscle or a headache or something like that. Like those are, those are pain and that's suffering that you go through for years. And that's what he's going through right now. And I mean, just being mocked, like I just, nobody likes being made fun of. And a couple things that I thought of when I was thinking about like ways I personally can relate to just being, just getting almost enraged sometimes when somebody mocks you is, this is gonna be kind of a lighthearted thing, but uh, try to help me get through the rest of this message and not be a blubbering mess up here. But as a Florida Gator fan, sure Jana can relate, my friends and family can relate, an opposing team doing the Gator Chomp makes me so mad. Like, it is like, it's, it's a perfect mockery. It is the perfect thing because it does exactly what they're, they're wanting it to do. They're making fun of us. And usually it comes after a loss, which fortunately Florida's lost a lot of games lately. So we're, we're, we're having to l learn and work our way through that and not be uh, angry about it. So, you know, I get mad a lot, but, you know, I pray a lot too. So we'll, we'll be all right. Um, but the other one is kind of a more real thing and kind of, you know, something I've done, struggled with all my life, but like, you know, being mocked for being like overweight, that's something that it hurts. It sucks. A lot of people get mocked for a lot of different things. And that's just been my cross to bear. But hey, that's why we're, uh, you know, right now we're on day seven of a fast and we've been on this weight loss journey the last few, last like year or so. So we're doing something about it. Stop with the cheeseburgers and hamburgers and, uh, you know, do something about it. Um, <laughs> but anyways, moving on. Isaiah 53, 3 tells us he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. So in this way, he's going through the mental hurt of betrayal and people just that, you know, were his people that he was just trying to spread the word, spread the, the, his saving knowledge of him too, that just completely turned their backs on him. And, you know, as someone who really, really, really is uh, almost loyal to a fault, I guess, like, you know, I'm very much a, to uh, use a quote, very much a no new friends kind of guy. Um, I don't make new friends a lot. So loyalty to me really hits home in the fact of betrayal hits home with me as I'm sure it does with a lot of you guys too. So like I started thinking about that and when you think it's not mentioned here, but the kind of betrayal that Jesus went through, two of his literally like his best friends, his disciples, two of them completely turned their back on him in his last days with Judas um, and uh, Peter betraying him in his final days in different ways. Like the, the pain and mental anguish and suffering once he came to that realization, like that would be just crazy to deal with. Um, but as hurt as he was, and as much as man has betrayed him and turned their backs on him, the thing that we got to realize is that we always have an opportunity for redemption. We always have an opportunity for restoration. So no matter how far gone you think you are, no matter how far gone you think a relationship is, how far that person's turned their back on you and maybe betrayed you in certain ways, there's always a chance for redemption. There's always a chance to be restored through the blood and love of Jesus Christ. Matthew 26, 20, excuse me, 27, 46 says at about three o'clock, Jesus called out with loud voice. Now y'all bear with me because I know I'm probably going to say this wrong and sound like a real dumb redneck, but 
he says it with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani, you know, got that, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And now this verse is one that there's a lot of different interpretations. There's a lot of different um, translations of it. You know, some might say, use the term abandoned, like this, like the NLT does here. A lot of us have heard before the verse where it said, why God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, and there's a lot of different, you know, opinions on what he really meant and what that verse really means and all of that kind of stuff. And I'm not necessarily here to get into the deep on that. Um, so don't come to me after the verse and, or after this sermon and hit me with an Oscar from the office. Well, Corey, actually, you know, because what I'll, basically what I'm using this verse for is basically that it's safe to say Jesus was hurt and he was alone up on the cross. There was nobody else there with him. He was the only one going through that mental and physical pain. And loneliness is a big issue today. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more present and prevalent. The more and more it feels like the last few years it's sped up because the more and more COVID stuff happened. And then te as technology increases, think about how I think about like kids today and how back when I was in high school, you know, here I am, you know, 35 year old grandpa, back in my day. Um, but we could not wait to get our driver's license. We, as soon as you did too, man, you were burning up the roads going to hang out with your friends at their houses. And there would be various houses that, you know, there might be 10 or 20 of us just hanging out, doing whatever high school kids do. And nowadays, like I hear all these stories about like, kids just don't do that anymore. For one, they don't get their driver's license till way later. They hang out with each other in like groups on like FaceTime or on like, you know, Instagram Live or whatever. Like they're not face to face. And, you know, technology is great and all, but when it's purporting and pushing forward that loneliness stuff that's where i think sometimes we need to maybe maybe back off a little bit maybe maybe pump the brakes take about 20 percent off um but because not it not only this was not only a problem for jesus again it's a problem for us today and it's one of the main risk factors for mental illness it's the, one of the main risk factors for things like depression it's one of the main risk factors for suicide which is becoming more and more of a problem especially and our young kids, and this is backed by data, this is not just Corey spouting out stuff, um, backed by data that in veterans, especially military veterans, and in kids 16 to 24 years old, it's one of the main risk factors and one of the main causes for serious depression, PTSD, and then down the road, unfortunately, it sometimes leads to suicide. Um, but as much as Jesus was fully man, he was also fully God, so he suffered both those ways. So next we'll say, Jesus suffered as God. And first, in 1 Peter 3.18, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in spirit. And then the second verse that we're going to hone in on in this part is 1 Peter 2.24, where he says, He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. So that last piece right there, by his wounds, we are healed. And they're not talking about just you know physical stuff like that. They're talking about eternal things. So the suffering that he dealt with on the cross as God is what dealt with our sin and the consequences of that sin and gives us the eternity that we have in heaven. Because other than uh, without him, they tell us that you got to be perfect to get to heaven. And I know I sure ain't. And I'm sure a lot of you can say that you probably aren't. Some of you might be poking or whatever your spouse right now saying, yeah, you definitely aren't. Um, but uh, if it weren't for that blood and him dealing with that through the crucifixion, we wouldn't even be able to talk about it. Um, so as we think about that, imagine that, you know, because we think about the Trinity, Jesus, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, stuff like that. Like, he knew the full ramifications of what he was doing. And he knew that he is the one thing that was giving us that eternity in heaven. And just imagine, again, the, 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 the realization in his mind of, oh my gosh, like the same people that I'm here to save are the same people that are putting me to death right now. And the crazy juxtaposition and, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff that goes through that, um, which kind of 
this week I was reading, you know, obviously I've been talking about a lot in past sermons, the Colson Fellows program that I'm in. And in one of the books that we've read um, is by a guy named J.I. Packer. It's called Knowing God. Phenomenal book. If anyone hasn't read it or is looking for a really, really good uh, faith-based book to read and give you new perspectives on things, highly, highly recommend it. It's called Knowing God. Um, but in that book, J.I. Packer makes the point that, and it's kind of, a, a, at first you're kind of like, whoa, what? Like, he says that not everyone is a child of God, which sounds very controversial, sounds very different from what we said. But what he says is that we're all adopted children of God because all of us are not, as we know, unfortunately, as much as I wish it was different, as much as everybody wishes it was different, not everyone is going to go to heaven. Not everybody is going to accept that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and that they need his salvation to get to heaven. So what he was making the point of is that the children of God are adopted children of God because we choose to be his children. And that through that, it kind of makes that relationship even more special. And it's kind of what God really intended it for because now we're not just getting something easy and just automatically, like it's not a, it's not a right. It's a, something that we chose to be. It's something that he chose us. So it's kind of an interesting take on that. Um, but as we're talking about the adoption and choosing of him, connects, connecting to him, Jesus wants us to suffer with him. And now this is the one that, like, even when I was presenting to Pastor Tim, he was kind of like, whoa, that's a, that's a heavy, heavy fill-in. That's a, something that people might not necessarily get. And then as I explained it, he's like, wow, okay, yeah, that makes sense. So bear with me here. And don't just take my words for it that Corey came up with this idea. Paul tells us in Philippians 3, verse 10, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him sharing in his death and as we talk about this i want us to think about it this way that suffering together brings us closer together and i'll say that a different way i've heard it talked about that there's two different types of fun i probably said this in sermons before but it's something that i think about a lot there's two types of fun type one type two type one is like instant immediate gratification like think about like a piece of birthday cake a roller coaster Something that immediately, like a, a quick one-liner joke, that immediately raises your dopamine levels, maybe makes you smile, makes you laugh, makes you happy for a moment, but it's not anything that's truly impactful. It's not truly anything that's going to change your life. Then there's the second type of fun, which in the moment doesn't seem fun, but it's stuff that sticks with you for a long time. And it's some, a lot of times it's tougher situations. So some examples of that might be um, stuff that it's, I've gone through that a lot of us can relate to. Having a vacation where there's hiccups, like a flight that gets delayed, hotel loses your reservation, rental car gets a flat tire, like, like stuff like that, where, where in the moment you're like, ah, this is so annoying, I'm so mad, like I do not want to be sleeping on the floor of the Dallas airport right now because I missed my connection flight because my first flight out of Tampa was late. Uh, yes, I've done that. My wife thinks it's disgusting, but listen, bro, if you're tired, you got to get that rest. Um, Another type of type two fun a lot of us have gone through. Really rough day at work, you know, and especially like if you're in, like I think about it like when I was at Enterprise. And Enterprise is, it's, you know, you're, I was either at the branch as a manager or at the airport as a manager. So you're, it's a team of people. And I think about some of those days where, you know, it's crazy. It's spring break time. You're starting the day with 100 reservations. You've got 20 cars. And you're supposed to you just magically out of thin air, you're supposed to poof, and have the rest of those cars. And so throughout the whole day, you're shifting around, you're picking up cars from drop locations, you're calling other branches, like you're having customers who are in your face, rightfully so, yelling and screaming at you because they're trying to go on vacation and you don't have their suburban. And they're it, it's in the moment, it's terrible. You're you're oh my god, like you're you're sweating more than I am right now because you're outside washing a car in a shirt and tie, like. It's terrible, but those are the days that like, I still have good buddies that I worked with in Enterprise. I haven't worked in Enterprise in like four or five years now, but we still will reminisce about, hey man, you remember that day in Palm Harbor where you know we got our butts kicked, but we all figured it out and we survived together. Or, hey man, you remember that time at the airport when you had a plane load of people land two hours late, you literally had zero cars on the ground and you were having to figure out Ubers and hotels and stuff like that. and like 
how crazy that was, but man, I'm glad we did it. We're better for it now because of it. And then the last one that might not really relate to a lot of people, but one that I thought about that is just uh, always makes me laugh when I think about type two fun is a few years back, me and my friends were going on a duck hunt in South Florida and it was 9 million degrees because why wouldn't it be in January? And so we're, and it was a hunt where you can't take a boat to where you're going. You have to use a uh, canoe. And a lot of the time, the water is so thin that you're literally, you're just out of the boat dragging your canoe through this muck and through this just nasty stuff. And then you're in these reeds and cattails. So you, we may or may not have gotten lost and went like this kind of route instead of just straight to our exit point. And then it, I, it, it's funny to laugh about now, but like in the moment, man, was he losing it and going through some real suffering at the time. One of my buddies got so stuck in the mud that he thought like he, he, he basically was like, I'm just going to die here. I'm stuck. Like I, I can't get out. I'm, I'm waist deep. And like the more he like struggled, it was like a kind of like a quick sandy type thing where like he just kept getting more and more and. I just, I don't know what court, just leave me. You're going to have to leave me and I'll figure it out. I'll just call Jessica and tell her I'll be all right. I love my kids or something. Yeah. But like now, like looking back on it, it's la it's laughable. But in the moment, like we were all suffering with the heat and exhaustion and stuff like that. But my, my dog was really going through it at the moment. But it's funny to laugh about now. It's something we still talk about and poke fun at later on. Um, so type two, again, is just, it's, it's what we remember. It's what we look back and laugh at because you made it through together and now you're closer because of it. you're united you're 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 stronger together and that's exactly what Paul is telling us here and then another example again from Paul which I don't know why Paul seems I mean is Paul like the biblical version of David Goggins if you don't know who David Goggins is google it afterwards you'll get it it'll make sense he's very much into he's a former Navy SEAL his like big phrase is like get hard like you know he's all about suffering and grinding through stuff and stuff like that so google his name and you'll it'll make more sense um if you don't know but anyways and paul writes in second timothy verses 1 7 through 10 for god has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity but of power love and self-discipline so never be ashamed to tell others about the lord and don't be ashamed of me either even though i'm in prison for him because paul is in prison as he's writing this no, I'm in prison with him. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserve it, but because that was his plan from before the beginning of time, to show us his grace through Jesus Christ. And now he has made all of this plain to us by appearing of Jesus of Christ Jesus, by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. So what he's basically telling us here, and it's so true, is that Christ followers, we don't always have an easy life. It's not just all sunshine and roses. And, you know, I think every one of us here can attest to that. You know, once I gave my life to Christ, it wasn't like immediately I won the lottery. I was debt free. I, all my joint pain was gone. And, you know, all, all that kind of stuff, it doesn't go away. It's not real. So being transparent about it, we have to kind of acknowledge that it's not going to be an easy life. There, there are still going to be tough times. There are still going to be peaks and valleys, and we're going to need to get through those times. So what I think kind of I want to hit on here is that what he really wants us here is to have some skin in the game. He wants us to be invested in our relationship. Again, be the adopted children of Jesus Christ. And thinking about that, then an analogy hit me that if anyone's ever heard of the analogy of being involved versus being invested, and it's been explained, you're talking about a chicken versus a pig and a plate, a, a breakfast plate. And it's, you know, listen, I got it. Uh, Diana's giving me a, what are you talking about? See, I knew I was going to get at least one of those looks today. I knew I was going to get one. Um, but in a plate, a breakfast plate, plate of eggs and bacon, talking about involved versus invested. The chicken is involved. The pig is invested because the pig had to give its life in order for you to have that bacon. So that's kind of the difference there. And I think that's exactly what Christ wants from every one of us. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to be here involved or excuse me, invested and 
doing life with each other, doing everything with him and with a Christian worldview in mind. Um, but as we talk about this, and as we talk about suffering, I don't want it to seem like it's like a, like the old like pirate saying where it's like the beatings will continue until morale improves. Like that's, that's not what I think Christ is doing here. I think what it is, is more like if you're lucky enough to be like me and have had either a manager or a parent or a coach who was there and at, in those tough times wraps their arm around you and says, Hey bud, I know we're going through it right now, but we're going to get through this. We're going to make it through. We're going to be all right. And what that does and what I think this entire message should center around is that all of this, all of this suffering, all of this pain, all of this anguish gives us hope. And hope is, I think, the most important thing any one single person can have. Because once you lose hope, you kind of lost everything. You got nothing to live for. So this, that's what he's telling us here is that all of us have hope. So where do we go from here? I think a passage that kind of sums it up that really kind of wraps this thing up with a bow is Romans 5 verses 3 through 5 where it says we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance and endurance develop, develop strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation and this hope will not lead us to dis disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. Amen. And that, y'all, that, that is what I want to drive home today. That is the message I want y'all to hear. That, yeah, he suffered as a man. Yeah, he suffered as a God. Yeah, we're all su called to suffer with him. But because of that suffering, we have the eternal hope and eventual victory in Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you this morning saying just humbly thank you so much for just... The hope that we have in you, Lord, we thank you that you went through all of that for us. And we know, Lord, that your your word and your your Bible tells us that you would have done it even if it had just been for one single person, even if it had just been for Corey, even if it had just been for Joe or Pastor Tim or whoever, you would have done it. So, Lord, I just thank you so much for the salvation that you provided us through your suffering. Thank you so much for the hope that we have in you. And thank you so much that at this Easter time, we know all of us have the gift of and the opportunity to have victory in Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>
appreciate y'all being here again. Keep in mind all of our Easter schedule, Good Friday, a couple different services and breakfast on Sunday, and the uh, diaper drive. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, again, we just come to you saying thank you, thank you, thank you for allowing us to be in your house today, Lord. Allowing us to sing your songs and hear your word and congregate with each other, Lord, and just feel your spirit here today, Lord. I just pray that um, through these words, through this these songs, and through this time here we spent together today, that all of us will try to seek you in the morning, and not just tomorrow morning, but every single morning, Lord. And I just pray that that, that message wash over all of us, and that all of us have an eternal hope in you, and that you keep us all safe, happy, healthy, and protected, and bring us back next time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.